All right, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming back. This is going to change. We're going to change hats a little bit. Okay. Okay. Can you all hear me a little bit better? Okay. So I broke the cardinal rule, and Betty's telling everybody to make sure that their microphone is close. So if it's not, somebody wave at the back or something. We'll get it right. How many of you have already been victims of a cyber attack? Wow, you guys are honest. Usually I get zero and I know everyone's lying, right? So good for you. Yep. So what we're going to do today is a couple of things. One, I'm going to introduce to you my friend Pete Cordero. Pete and I met about 15 plus years ago when we were both doing national security work. We were at the War College in D.C., uh, uh, surrounded by war fighters, CIA, NSA, DOD, Navy SEALs. Pete was at the FBI at the time. I was at DOD. And we were doing programs like psychological operations, info ops, all the fun stuff, and have kept in touch over the years. And now his work is primarily on cybersecurity and doing things like threat hunting and those types of things. All of this, you're probably sitting there saying, how does that relate to me? It's because you are a bad guy's beautiful target. Because you lie very much in the intersection between great data, funder data, board member data, student data, government database data, your own personal data. And so how can we harden our defenses? What can we do? How do we work through this? So we thought it'd be a good idea to give you a little preview of what do you do? How do you navigate this? Very practical. And with this, with this, I want to introduce to you my friend Pete. Let him tell you a little bit about his story. And then I'm going to give you the scenario of what we're going to do today. Rosie, thank you. And it's a privilege to be here with all of you. And I, I will tell you, up until two days ago, I did not really know what college promise meant. Over the last day and a half, I've been very impressed with the wonderful, wonderful work that each and every one of you are doing. And upon reflection last night and this morning, kind of give you a little bit of background. My, I, I am a first-gen American. My mother immigrated from Mexico. I have eight brothers and sisters. All of us, my mother and father did not go to college. But my mother left Mexico to attend college because my grandmother would not let her or allow her to. So all eight of us, you know, in El Paso, we knew we were going to college because we had two wonderful parents, specifically my mother and my dad was her, you know, her support, or we all went to school. Um, I am a CPA by training. And the reason for that is because I, I wanted to be an FBI agent as a kid. And at 17, I met my first FBI agent who had gone to my high school, gone to my college, and I still remember him. So when you talk about mentors, I bothered that poor guy for the next four years. He said, just tell me when you graduate. You know. So I became an accountant. I had no idea what that meant, um, and I hated it because <laughs> I was an accountant for a year. But I ended up getting my certification to be a CPA because that made me more competitive than the 1,500 applicants that were vying for that one spot. So I did that. I spent 27 years with a phenomenal organization where I felt I belonged. Um, To case all those uh, characteristics needed for today's uh, job, you know, job, uh, your current employment, we had that in the Bureau. I led teams. I was fortunate enough to be in the Osama bin Laden unit on September 11, 2001, I was one of four supervisors, but uh, that was a bad time for us. I was a counterterrorism guy for a long time. When I w- was at the War College with Rosie, I attended DOD Cyber College. That converted me. So when I tell you cyber scares me much more than terrorism, that should, uh, that should at least pique your interest a little bit. So I was fortunate enough to run cyber operations in the FBI. Um, I taught at our National Academy, uh, an undergrad and graduate cyber leadership class. I actually brought one of my two books that I've written. So I've got some parting gifts for anybody who wants any. 
Um, and I've developed an eight-hour cyber leadership course for executives because I believe that to be the biggest, the, the largest strategic problem in addressing cyber as a nation. So hopefully, um, you know, a little bit of background and uh, so we can start our conversation. So part of where Pete and I and in some of the earlier work we've done is usually getting the call, right? So right now you're about to get a call. And the call is your bank. Basically, all of your accounts have been liquidated. Your nonprofit has no money left. Somebody somewhere at some point sent you an email. You decided to click or one of your employees decided to open an attachment. They were able to infiltrate you don't have multi-factor authentication at your work office, so you don't have that in place. So it was really easy pickings, right? Like it took minutes. They've been sitting in your email account usually about 30 days, harvesting all your emails, making sure that they get into your employees' emails, tracking who you contact, who do you email, looking up to see are they affluent, are they not, who, what, are, what is your board activity? Do they have money? Do they represent organizations that are interesting? So in that 30 days, other than scanning all your emails and learning how you talk and learning how you write, right, they set up a rule. They set up a rule in your inbox that everything coming from their targets doesn't ever go to your inbox. It goes to a special folder you'll never see, you don't know is there. And they start talking to these people because these people trust you. They know who you are. You're their friend, right? And the person knows everything about your relationship because they've been reading all the emails you had with this person over the last, I mean, they've had 30 days, so they know you, right? And so suddenly, especially for high net worth folks, you know, you've had a bank change. Did you know that? They changed your bank account. They processed all that paperwork. It came from your email account. They had no reason not to trust it. They set up a new phone number for you. And that money has started to move. And you won't know until the check bounce, but the money moved a long time ago. So suddenly, they're on to the next. They're now talking and learning about all the people that are on your board and their organizations. And you'll find out whether your checks bounce or you're going to get that call. And that call is probably going to be the FBI or the state's attorney saying, you're part of bank fraud. You're part of a breach. And who's your board? And we intend to show up here tomorrow to interview you or today. And I hope you're ready. And I hope all the people that are implicated. But oh, by the way, it was your email that set all this stuff off. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to say, because 99% of people say this. I didn't write that email. Right? And they're going to say, oh, no, but you did. Is this your email address? Well, yes, it is. Is this your email account? And then they'll take over your email, and everything you've got in there will now be viewed and scrutinized, and they'll be able to figure this all out. And while you're, stir you're thinking through all of this, right, you're going to be basically paralyzed because how many of you have been in that situation and navigated the FBI, the state's attorney, your bank, and your funders all looking at you saying, what has happened and how are we vulnerable? How many of you all have faced that? Yeah, Martha's faced that because she was in the federal government. That have high, high bucks over there. And so what we're going to talk to you about today is what do you do? What do you do to make sure that you don't now become the victim of the new process, which is the threat hunting that's about to start and happen? So, Pete, I'm sitting here, the state's attorney, the FBI. My fr I've already, hopefully, if you have cyber insurance, you've already called your insurer because if you don't call them within 48 hours, you may not be eligible for coverage. But let me tell you, when everyone's looking at you, the last thing you're thinking about is, did I call my insurer? Right? So, Pete, what do I do? So let me start off with a question. How many in here are all of a sudden frightened? And, uh, okay, keep your hands up. How many of you have had any type of cyber leadership training since you're responsible leaders for your program? <laughs> See, that's the challenge. So all of a sudden... Cybersecurity is an enterprise risk. And guess what? As a leadership team, an executive management team, you own it. It's not the chief information security officer. It's not the chief information officer. It's management. So there's a, a couple of regulations that are already in play for, not, for higher education 
you're part of the government facility sector. So there's an act called the Cersei Act of 2022 that starting this year, because the rules just came out, you will have to report a cyber incident within 72 hours and a say you have a ransomware attack and you pay the extortion amount. You have to report that within 24 hours. So it is going to affect you if you're in higher education. So keep that in mind. But to going pivoting back to Rosie's point, we've arrived. We're probably going to, if she's called her insurance company, there's third-party vendors that are preferred to your forensic investigators. They're going to come in. We're going to work side by side with them. She just described a nightmare situation. You've got intrusion uh, activity on your email server. You've got, you, they, they're probably in your entire network, okay? There's multiple intrusion vectors. Ransomware is just one attack vector. So with that, you're going to have to come in, look at all your network logging data. Logging is every time you click on, say you open your, turn on your computer, you open Word, you open an email, there is a log. It's a record. That is how investigators, both forensic, from third-party forensic, like CrowdStrike, EY, whoever, and the FBI rebuild the attack. If you don't have good logging, there's nothing I can do for you. So let's highlight that piece of it. How huge. many of you all even know if the current software system, whether it's Microsoft, already is tracking your login keystrokes? If you don't, I'm glad you do. If you don't, you need to find out because I'll tell you what happens oftentimes is, especially because we are cost constrained, we don't take that step. We save that $3 a month per license and we don't get the capability in there. And that's going to really hurt you because suddenly you're not a victim. You were negligent. Right? You, didn't, you didn't put the key or the lock on the door so people can get into the files, right? And so there is, there is a lot to this process, which is, are you a victim or were you, in fact, negligent in not protecting your data? And that matters, especially when insurance gets involved. The other thing I want to highlight for you is when you get your insurance, all of you should go back and look at your insurance and see when the last time it was that you reviewed it. You have DNO insurance if you're a nonprofit. Look at your cyber insurance. I want you to take five minutes and find out who your preferred vendors are. Pete mentioned that. Why do you care? Because sometimes we get the cheap insurance, right? Sometimes it's the, I'm going to spend the thousand bucks a year. I don't want to spend the two thousand. But when an incident happens, if you're going to use your insurance, you can only use the vendor that they allow or they won't cover you. That is not, I'm telling you right now, when the FBI is interviewing you, is not the moment you want the cheapest vendor protecting you and sitting across the, the room, right? So figure out who the providers are that will have to come in. Nine times out of ten, when we would get involved and when we have consulted on the stuff, we actually set the insurance aside because the vendors are so poor and have to go out and procure separate threat hunters and separate experts because that's the only way we'll actually be able to protect the organization. So that's, I think, a step for, for you all to be proactive to be aware of that. And it's a great point. All of you are targets. Understand that. There's five classes of cyber threat actors. You have hacktivists. They conduct cyber threat activity for a social or political purpose, such as anonymous. You've got transnational cyber criminal groups whose main function in life is to steal ones and zeros data because they've learned to monetize it. And our organizations are full of that. Three, insider threats, trusted individuals who have access or who have had access that conduct either malicious or non-malicious activity. Terrorist groups. The FBI defines terrorism activity as violent crimes conducted on behalf or uh, by a foreign terrorist, a designated terrorist group or a nation state actor. We have an example where the Iranians, we, uh, the FBI indicted three hackers who did hacking against our aerospace and satellite companies on behalf of them. And the last is what I call the A-team, your nation state advanced persistent threat or APT actor. These are the best. And I'll, I'll tell you, your research, your donor activity, how many of you have high net value folks that they're not on LinkedIn, you can't find their email, 
but you have their email because they provide wonderful donations to your organization. Well, guess what? If I can't find them through there, I'm going to go. If you don't have a great security program, I'm going to compromise you. And the average time right now, as of this year, is I'm in your system for 277 days. That's nine months. You know how much damage I can do in nine months? Keep that in mind. So when you're training your folks, send them to the best training. It's an investment in your organization's legacy. Because if you get breached, let me tell you, there's three impacts. The tactical impact. So I click on a phishing email and I encrypt my workstation. That's the tactical impact. That ransomware is then spread across your environment. And all your workstations and servers go down because they're encrypted. That's the operational impact. Now you bring in the third-party forensic investigators. You've got regulators. You've got legal liability if you're personal identifying information or PII or protected health information has just gone out the window. Imagine the impact to your brand. How do you go back to your uh, donors and say, "Well, well, we'll fix this. We'll fix this. That's the strategic impact of a cyber breach. About two years ago, their nonprofit, I will not name their name, but we would all know them if I said it. They had a very large Gates grant. Whoever's tweeting, live tweeting, don't tweet this. Um, we're ha- <laughs> I'll look at my guys over there. Um, and they compromised about 200 student records. And so those records are sold usually, what, 100 bucks a record, 75 bucks a record, um, cheap right, but make some cash at some point. And so let's just say that the, that their funders got very nervous, right, because they realized that that type of reputational hit was really going to be earth-shattering for that organization. That organization has yet to recover, if ever. Um, and so you want it. I think there's some thoughtfulness on there. The other piece I would say it, from a physical security perspective is, and and I mean this with a lot of love, but in the military, there's a term we'd say is you're only as strong as your weakest link. Think of the person, the most junior person in your organization that has access or manages account access, logins, issue emails on your behalf. You know, the tasks that nobody kind of wants to do, like how do I get my email set up? Who can reset passwords? Those types of things. So a lot of times we spend time doing drop-ins in organizations. And so some physical security checks, an example would be we'll send a, a buddy, a friend. They'll show up. You know, they're HVAC workers, right? Pete's dressed, dressed up in a little HVAC uniform, and he shows up in your organization. And, you know, I got you know, to gotta set up. You know, your boss has something wrong with her HVAC. I got something's happening with the system. I need to go in there, right? And the very nice person in the front desk was like, please come on in. Right. And so there's from a physical security perspective or that very, very eager individual who finds that external drive and says, well, I wonder where this came from. It's here on the floor in my front office. Pete, the HVAC worker, dropped it on his way out the door. But somebody's going to be like, I wonder whose it is. How do I find out whose it is? Let me plug it into my computer and find out whose it is because maybe it's somebody important in my organization and I, I don't know who lost it. Thank you. You just gave me access. You've just been loaded up with a bunch of virus and, you know, welcome to the game, right? And then finally... I'm going to use a fun one, which is how we actually get usually access to high value email accounts, which is, you know, for some of you in big organizations, you know, not all of your people don't know who you are, right? They may not recognize your voice. They may not know exactly what you sound like. You're not talking to everybody. But um, in one instance, you know, you'll get a phone call and it'll be the person on the other end saying, I, I need to have to your IT shop, your IT person, I need to have my account reset. Can you hurry up? I need to get my account reset. And then in, in you know, what I've used, I've, you know, I have no shame. I've used my kid in the background and my kid's going, come on, mom, I got to go to soccer. Come on, mom, what's going on? What's going on? And the person on the other end is saying, God, I feel bad for Rosie. Her kid really needs to go. She just needs to get her password reset. Okay, ma'am, you don't have to give me the code. Here's your new password, right? And so these are just easy ways where very thoughtful, caring people give the keys to the kingdom away really easily. And so there's, there's reasons why 
training and just tests sometimes are really helpful to make sure that you're protecting yourself, sometimes from random act of kindness, right? It'll be literally people in your organization who are trying to do right, but these folks take advantage of that every time. So that's social engineering. And what Rosie previously described is what ethical hackers or penetration testers that are hired by our organization will try to get access. They don't tell everybody in the organization that we're having a pen test. So that we come in, boom, you know, the pen testers will come in and they'll ask for like the same story she just repeated. And we can drop USBs, a hard drive, even some uh, of the Pony Express is what it's called. It's, uh, it scans for open ports and things that you get, you get an insider, if you will, in there. And then once I'm on the inside, that help you. You know, so it's, it's, we used to say it's hard and, you know, hard on the outside and soft and gooey in the center. And that's, that's how, once they start moving laterally, you're in trouble. And just to give you an idea, over the last five years, there's been almost 600 higher education institutions hit by ransomware. This is the latest stat. I'm sure it's a lot more than that because a lot of this is not reported. You just handle it. You hope you have backup. And a lot of them won't even tell management, the leadership team. They Just, oh, let's fix it and uh, keep moving. Keep that in mind. So I think now let's move to like, what do you do? What do you do if you don't have an unlimited budget? What do you do if you don't have maybe a board that even understands this stuff? I think a lot of times, sometimes it's difficult when your board itself, you know, I've, I've worked with organizations and they'll be the first to say their board is like, hey, we don't want to spend a couple thousand bucks for an annual security assessment. Can you just get your friend to do it? Can somebody just kind of do something cursory? Um, and so how do you, what do you do? What do you prioritize first? So I, you know, when you, when you, before you get hit, you know, let's say it's not, you haven't been hit. You're, you're actually looking at this. There's first, there's three types of training before I go into that initial, once you get hit by a breach, your information security and awareness training is a must that must happen throughout the year. Who loves the phishing exercises and those ugly emails and right? That's what I'm talking about. It, it teaches you how to t- um, operate a computer safely. And you'll still, you know, click on phishing emails. But at the end of the day, that's one. Second is your cyber professionals, whoever your cyber professional is. It could be a third party. Make sure they have good cyber professional training and certifications that are current, not expired but five years ago because then they're, out of the, they're not in the game. And third, which I consider the, to be the most ignored, is cyber leadership training where your executive management team and your board understand cyber with a foundational understanding of the different facets. You're not experts. You can use an expert as an advisor but at least you have a robust conversation with your chief information security officer. So given that, you get breached, what do you do? You know, you come in, um, that is right. Uh, the question, I can go off on it. I can talk about this all day long. So we start, you know, you start, you look at it, you've gotten, uh, you've gone through the breach, you've gone through the forensic investigators. They're gonna provide you a, a forensic report. It's going to say, this is what transpired. This was what we were able to reconstruct. All right. So once you, they're also going to identify gaps and vulnerabilities. That's what we call a roadmaps in or a strategy that you all of a sudden you now have. Rosie was talking about an assessment. A lot of times these forensic investigators will do that assessment for you. Okay. That assessment if you, there's a framework called the NIST cybersecurity framework. I love it because it's easy. There's five functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. The first three are the preventative side. The response and recover is the reactive side. Your, an assessment will measure on a scale from one to five, those five functions. All right. So you can have, if you have a two, eh, you're not doing so hot. Three to four, you're doing all right. I've, I've rarely seen fives. Usually that's in the banking industry, but you know, not across the board. So at the end of the day, now you have a rating. You now understand where you're at as an executive leadership team. This is where 
Now you've got gaps that you've identified, and you have to seriously look at that roadmap and actually own it. Start looking at it. Get someone responsible. Like, say, if you don't have a chief information security officer, hire a virtual one to lead that effort so they can prioritize and you can provide the strategic resources, the funding, to get your cyber risk management program to a mature level. Because I can tell you, the Bureau, the FBI just reported uh, two weeks ago, ransomware victims were being retargeted by different ransomware groups with a different variant. So imagine getting hit. You're discussing, and, you know, I used to say in in the Bureau, I tell our victims, please don't pay the ransom. (laughs) I've been out in the consulting world. It's a business decision. If you had your backup connected to your network and didn't test out your resiliency and they got to it and encrypted everything, guess what? You're going to have a serious conversation about paying that extortion because how many of you can work without the data that you have in your in your, organize, uh, your enterprise. I don't know of one agency, one government, or one organization. So that's what you have to worry about. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and ransomware is just one intrusion vector. Remember that. We can t- I can spend 30 minutes on vulnerabilities. Who has a Windows machine at home? Windows 10, Windows 11. A couple of weeks ago, there was, you know, it's, oh, it's automatic updates, right? takes about 10 minutes. This month, just on Microsoft alone, it's not picking on Microsoft. Microsoft is known for Patch Tuesday. The first Tuesday of every month, they come up with patches or controls for vulnerabilities that security researchers or Microsoft professionals have identified within the Microsoft environment. So there's four ratings, and I try to teach this to all my executives. Critical, important, medium, and low. Why do I point these out? Because last uh, two weeks ago, or last week, there was 103 vulnerabilities that Microsoft came out with. I think 10 of them were critical. Microsoft's recommendation on those critical vulnerabilities is that they be patched immediately. And the reason for that is there's no user interaction required for a cyber threat actor to come in and exploit that vulnerability and have immediate access to your network. I don't need a username or password. I'm in your network. So vulnerabilities are something. Um, there's a couple of regulations that just passed, uh, one being the New York Department of Financial Services five days ago, and I believe them to have the most rigorous cybersecurity regulation in the country. And some of the requirements, an annual audit by external or internal auditors. Uh, your chief information security officer has to have the authority to actually do their job. They have to report to the board at least once a year on their cybersecurity program and any material weaknesses. And then the CEO or the, they call it the, the most senior official, it used to be the CEO, has to sign with this chief information security officer the compliance to this regulation at, at at the end of the year. Imagine that. Your CEO has to sign with your CISO saying, hey, we've done all this. These are the regulations that are starting to, that have passed. The SEC has one for the executive management for publicly traded companies. Circia, as I mentioned earlier. Bottom line, as executives, as leaders within your organization, you are now responsible and the regulators will be looking at you. And I will, I will end, uh, conclude on this segment on saying the, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission last week, who remembers SolarWinds, December 2020? I consider, I think it's one of the largest breaches we've ever had. It hit a lot of the U.S. government agencies. and um, It hit Microsoft. It hit Deloitte. It hit Cisco. And those, those are some big names in information technology, but it was the Russian External Intelligence Service, or the SVR. Well, the SEC just charged SolarWinds as a company and their chief information security officer with fraud and internal control failures. We've never seen that before. They went in and started investigating, looking at all the security reporting to management, 
the security reports that were emailed, instant messaging between the engineers. There's a 70-page complaint that details this on their pump, what they would put on their website as how secure they were. Um, their password policy saying it was so stringent when in fact it wasn't. Access control for privileged and user accounts. They said it was very strong with multi-factor authentication. That was not the fact. Uh, that was there was no basis in fact for that. And a, a few other disasters. So right now, I can tell you the the cybersecurity community is very concerned, but it's because the CISO was charged. I would reflect as a senior leader, you all should be concerned. Because now, if the one thing I've seen many, many times at audit committee meetings, at board meetings, at executive meetings, is a chief information security officer giving you a cyber threat report. For 30 minutes, they talk about what I call just the good. Oh, we're doing this, this, and this, because you only give them 30 minutes with the board or the executive management team. All of a sudden, uh, well, there is a couple of challenges we're working on, and then time runs out. But in this report that you just passed to management, it cites all these critical vulnerabilities that won't be fixed for a year. You had penetration tests or ethical hackers testing your systems, and you found all these vulnerabilities. You have older machines that no longer can be updated and are are still on your network. That's a nightmare for executive management right now. So from a, from a practical perspective, many of you are saying, look, that's that budget, what does that look like? And I, I would say just very candidly, there's things you can do. Hopefully that's not a cyber attack. Um, there's things you can do cost consciously, right? Like number one, we talked about the logging infrastructure. I'm just going to go through very quick. Here's some hacks. Keep it in your back pocket. Think about this. One, what type of software are you using? Do you, are you tracking? Would those logs be available because you want to make sure that that happens? You have multi-factor authentication in place. You have to have it. You'd be surprised how many organizations don't use it because they find it annoying to have to turn around and do it, you know, have to validate from their phone. That, if you do not have it, let me tell you, if you get hacked and you did not have MFA, you are not a sympathetic victim, candidly. So MFA for sure. Management by walking around, walk around your staff's desks, open up that first middle drawer, just do it. And if you find passwords sitting in there, I cannot tell you how many times every password is found in that first top drawer. It isn't even done backwards, y'all. Like they just kind of like leave it there and they've got fancy passwords like I love UT Knoxville, right? Ex- exclamation point. They add the exclamation point. So there's something unique, Right. But those things are just simple, simple things that you can do to make sure that you're protecting yourself. Those annual assessments, realistically, I mean, for a couple thousand bucks, you can probably get a decent either software system to run some levels of of testing or to do that assessment on your, you should, you know, annually, you should think about having a partner to prevent crisis If you do not have a policy for a response to an attack, I would urge you, if you don't have one in place, you don't know where to get one, email us. We will send you a sample of one. You want a crisis response team because in the moment, everybody freezes. Everybody gets scared and everybody freezes. And I'm going to give you three tips. Uh, And I'm going to look back at my interns. Don't put this online because I don't want the bad guys targeting my home address tonight. What you're going to do is, number one, who's the attorney you're going to call? Because you're going to run the cyber incident through an attorney. You're not going to be that person. You want an attorney that's going to protect you and has law enforcement training because suddenly that FBI, as much as I love you, Pete, is not just showing up because now they are triggered to have to deal with that legal counsel. And they immediately stop that forcing themselves in because you put a barrier and said, nope, I'm a victim and we've got procedures in place. So who's that attorney that's going to be your person in the cyber attack. It also puts a wrapper around the activities that you're going to have to do to remediate, to figure out who's the attacker. They'll look at those ISP addresses and see which network has gotten in there. Is it just an amateur? Maybe, you know, somebody in your local hometown that's like interested or is it a bad state, you know, kind of coming at you for that. So you want that crisis response team, attorney, 
crisis response team? Who on your board will be part of that crisis response team that understands even a little bit what we're talking about, right? If you don't have a board that can respond to this, think of getting someone on your board that can serve as a liaison back to your governance system when this happens because finances, your 990, your future insurance will all kind of get connected around all this stuff. So that crisis response is going to be really, really important. And then understand that you'll want to contact your funders. Because you're not going to want to. Trust me, you're not going to want to. But if you go and say we've been a victim, 99% of these funders are going to say we get it. We understand. Because they've probably been victims too, right, at some point along the way. So be proactive and understand that your posture is to be, let's get the bad guys versus, like, you are the bad guy in this, right? Like, let's go find the bad guys. So work quickly, be part of a solution so we can find the bad guys. Who's done any tabletop exercises on a cyber attack? Oh, my God. Okay. So I think, Pete, one of the things I was going to ask you, Pete, you know, and, and one of what something we're thinking about is how can we get some of the training that you've done at no cost available to the leaders? So if you decide you want to do on your own some cyber training, you know, without having cost as an issue. So we're going to work together on a partnership to figure out how can we get you some good top of the line training that you can share with your staff, that you can share with yourself you know, and, and feel comfortable on this stuff. So I really appreciate that no, no, commitment no. from you on that because I, I think that the community would benefit for sure. And I would also add, who's heard of the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency or CISA from DHS? If you don't, they have a wonderful, wonderful list of literature, you know, cyber literature, how to deal with ransomware attacks, how to deal with incident response, they have free services as higher ed- if you're part of the higher education sector they provide penetration testing which is you know acting as uh, hackers to test your systems they conduct vulnerability assessments so they can scan your networks all at no charge they can come do uh, phishing email training as well they they have no mechanism to charge uh, critical infrastructure sector uh, organizations and you're part of that so you know there's um, don't just because it's CISA, educate yourself. They can help. I can tell you. And and the more you learn about it, the better off that you will be. In the time, because there's two types of companies: the ones that we know have been hacked, the poor souls that know don't know that they've been hacked. Part of our job in the bureau was to go out, and it continues today, is notify organizations that have been victims of breaches. As of this year's report. Only one in three breaches were uh, actually identified by internal cyber professionals. The other 66, either by the cyber threat actors, when you're hit, getting hit with that extortion, or the FBI or Secret Service or CISA coming by to say, mm, you've got a problem. So you want to take some questions? Yes. Yes. All right. And come on. I promise you. Megan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ben. First of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, I, I work for Tennessee Achieves, and I'm <clears throat> been part of the organization for 12 years. And I think that a lot of people in this room probably understand that at nonprofits, there are a lot of people here who have um, – multiple jobs. It's like three jobs rolled into one. And so um, I've gotten the fun job of like researching liability insurance and cyber liability insurance. And so I'm probably not going to sleep for the next couple of nights. So, um, but this is really helpful. You know, the more you you know, and the more you're aware, um, the, the better that is. And so I would love all of the training and, and just the like, steps to take one to make sure that we know as a leadership team what we need to be aware of um and then any type of like template in terms of you know having that policy ready right like i love being in the proactive space in all of the spaces um instead of of the reactive space and so this might not be an in real time answer to the question but like the resources um and then one of the hats that I wear is bringing new people into our organization. So I would love who are 
very naive in a, in a lot of ways. I mean that like in a, in a loving way. But, um, you know, we've had people who have, who have responded to text messages because they think it's coming from the top and they just, they're so ready, you know, to prove themselves. And you're like, no, no, right? And it's been small. We've been able to figure it out. Um, but can you speak specifically to um, training through like new hire orientation, like what we need to be doing specifically with the people who, um, you know, might not be as familiar with those phishing emails and those types of things? Please. So when I was with Ernst and Young and another company, we used to use no before. I'm vendor agnostic, but they're solid. They are solid. Sands Institute has one, but they're a little more pricey. No before is by seat, you know, the number of, of employees. And it's solid training. Um, so I, that's where I would start for, regarding your, your folks. There's a number of uh, templates with the, their ISACs information sharing analysis centers. And I know there's an NGO ISAC, and forgive me, I, I can't remember the educational one. But these ISACs have all these wonderful resources, such as policy templates as well as well as threat intelligence that's impacting your specific sector. You need to educate your employees on who's coming after you, you know, at the end of the day. And to Rosie's point, I have, you know, I forgot to mention, whoever wants one of my books, I left some in here. If there's not enough, I'm at, what, what's the Cumberland? Cumberland. I have more in my truck, in my Tahoe. So if you don't get one, you know, just uh, ping me out. I don't even know how to get, I'll pass out my number in just a moment and just, I'll meet you and get, get you another one. But I, from my books and my course, I developed an eight hour cyber leadership executive course that's online. And I'm going to work with uh, Rosie and her, and her organization to try to figure out how I can provide this to you all at no cost. Because at the end of the day, it's like pulling teeth on the private sector side because no executive wants to know that, you know, they don't know something. But I know in this space, you all are challenged with resources. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, you can get it done in a couple of weeks. I've gotten great feedback. And you can learn in eight hours what you need to know. So Pete's being very humble because his eight-hour course is used by like Fortune 500 executives. I mean, this is something that he does across the country. It's thousands of dollars usually, and he is gifting it to all of the College Promise community because he wants to make sure, especially as a first gen, uh, he wants to make sure that you get access to that. So if that's something you all are interested in, we will work and send out some information. It's something you can share with your leadership team or your, your board of directors. We think that it's a it's an important step to take. Uh, in, be, in making that happen. Uh, I have personally taken it, and I will, I will tell you, it will take you a little bit of time, uh, meaning you're not going to do it in one sitting, but you will feel very comfortable <laughs> with the, these issues once you've actually gone through it. It's great professional development. All the I've way got around. a recommended two-week schedule on the website. Please use that. If you do, now, I've had students who were on a six-hour drive who did it in six hours, you know, they said, Pete, that was a lot of information. I had to pull over and take some of those tests because there's some, you know, some testing. If you do it, you'll pass. Don't worry. And so just keep that in mind. Do the two weeks. Just put it on and, and stay committed. At the end of the day, you lead by example. If your people see you take that course, you hang up your certificate on your office, guess what? You have just set an organizational strategy in motion. A cyber culture starts from the top and flows down. And that's what we need to change today. I mean, we wanted to have this conversation with you specifically because we spent all day talking about let's use AI, let's use technology more, let's embrace it, let's make sure there's representation. This is the other side of the equation, right? As, we, as you become more and more engaged, you also have to be a little bit more savvy on the how do you put you know, systems and controls in place. Any other questions from the audience, sir? Um, my question is more on the side of prevention. So I also work with Tennessee Achieves and a lot of our staff travels. That's a significant portion of some of our um, newer staff members. And so with that traveling, there's a lot of accessing different uh, internet access points from random coffee shops, college campuses, hotels, wherever it may be. Any advice or any yes. ideas on how to kind of mitigate, you know, kind of add in protection there, how to protect ourselves? <laughs> so this, we laugh because, you know, it, the, um, oh my God. You know, Starbucks Wi-Fi is not your friend, 
right? It's, I know it's cool. It's easy. It's, it is not your friend, right? Uh, if you're at the airport, airport, um, yes. Wi-Fi is free and fantastic. Not your friend, even on an airplane. It is not your friend. Um, if you have, a, if you don't have an, if you're logging in to, with organizational hardware and you don't have a MiFi or a very specific, you know, VPN pathway through, then that, then you're, you're vulnerable. Remote access is a killer. Always understand that you can only connect to a secured Wi-Fi. And if you're connecting at Starbucks, the airport, that's not, how do you know it's secure? The hotel connected me. I killed it. I was like, wait, I didn't ask to connect to that. Why? Because it's open. It's not secure. There's a certain airline I fly quite a bit. The moment I connect my uh, iPhone to it, it says insecure network and I kill it. I don't watch their movies. I don't, I don't do any of that. How many of you charge your iPhones or your um, Androids, not with the outlet, but actually the USB port, the 2.0? Don't do that. Bad guys put malware in there. So the moment you stick that in, it drops on your phone. So CISA has a great how to, u- how to travel and how to safely uh, use mobile devices on their website. So look up CISA. And that pass it, send that out to all your, your folks. And remember, use MFA, multi-factor authentication, either through a VP, a virtual private network, a VPN, or a hotspot. I use a hotspot. I don't connect to anything other than my hotspot and my Wi-Fi at home. And I'm constantly checking its status. I know we threw a lot of information out there. Would you all feel better if we pulled these resources for you and sent you in kind of an after action after this and just put it all in one place with some of the CISA resources deal? I think let's do it. I think it, I think that'll probably make it more uniform all the way. Happy to do that. Martha, Owen, Matt. Okay. So Sorry, multi- could you fa- just talk for yes. a minute about two things? Factor authentication, because we just put that in, or Rosie, make sure we do that That's at College exactly right. So it's, it used to be called two-factor, now it's multi-factor. So using, you can use your username and password. Multi-factor would include either a biometric, a fingerprint, a face ID, a uh, token, such as the RSA token, Duo, Norton, where every minute it changes. And that is this, you know, if you log in using, you know, if I log in using Pete Cordero uh, at Gmail and that with this password, how do you know it's Pete Cordero? You don't. You just know someone has my credentials. It could be me. But if I use that multi-factor authentication that was issued to me by the system administrator and I have a number, punches in, and it matches the system administrators, I am now had multi-factor authentication, and so they know it's P. Cordero. So that is what MFA is. And I can assure you, if you have any remote access, like people logging into your internal servers, please use MFA. That is a vulnerable intrusion vector that's constantly being looked at by cyber threat actors. So if you're connecting from, you know, outside, from home into your university, you know, you're traveling from a hotel. Make sure your people get MFA. Okay. Last question. Yes, ma'am. Oh. And, and you know what I will, how many of you think you cannot learn this? I am so proud of you. And only one, well, I'll tell you, when I was at, the, at Quantico at the National Academy, that's the law enforcement's premier law enforcement program in the world. Law enforcement executives from around the world come in and live at Quantico for 10 weeks. So, you know, I had over 300 students from around the world and 99% of them had no cyber training. And after 10 weeks, they weren't afraid of this thing. You know, I, so the 44 hours included a couple of papers that you want nothing to do with. You know, that's why I brought it down to eight hours. It's derived from that coursework. And what I've learned, I can tell you right now I have 14 certifications. All right. Most of them are cyber. I'm, I'm a CPA in two states. The rest are cyber. And the reason for that is cyber changes all the time. 
And what I have done is I've taken six day courses that cost $9,000, $1,000 for the test, and three months of studying since 2011, continuously. I've taken 16 of those courses since then. And I can tell you I'm humbled every time I take a course because of what I don't know. But I've taken that material and I've kind of synthesized it like I, I was teaching my executives, you know, adult learning. What do I need to know as an executive to effectively manage this enterprise risk? That's what I've done. So it's not, you don't have to be a technical expert. You just have to understand the different facets. Your enterprise, your mobile, mobile apps, uh, wire, wireless, uh, industrial control systems, IoT, defense and death, response and recovery, cybercrime, hacktivism, nation state actors, private sector partnerships. So after a while, you're like, man, that's a lot, Pete. Now, I've gotten it down to where it's manageable. You won't be an expert, but you'll be able to do one thing that I think is missing today. Have a continuous and robust dialogue with your chief information security officer to discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because you got to, once they give you that hot potato, here's the the bad and the ugly. Do you want to own that? Do you want to hold that? No. You're going to find some resources to fix that. And that's what needs to change strategically for us to address this. So I'll close with a quote that we had from an earlier speaker, which was, which I love when she, um, I believe she said, you can't be what you can't see, right? And I, I want to, I want to celebrate because Pete would have been a college promise scholar for us, right? He's from El Paso, Texas, my hometown. He has spent his life doing public service and doing great things. When I asked him if he would consider coming down, he said, I'll be there. And I know, I think you all have seen, he's been here all two days. I mean, in person, has not missed a session. And after last night, he said, how can I give back to this community? So join me in thanking him for taking this. Thank you to you. Thank you to you. You're awesome. You're awesome. Thank you so much, Rosie and Pete. Um, They say fear is 